everyone, my name's Annette and welcome back to Cotto Verdi. Today I want to show you one of the most exciting projects we're going to have in our garden this year and that is planting loads of trees. Do you ever wish you could just walk through like an avenue of trees of blossom in your own garden? What I'm trying to create at the bottom of my garden is this lovely sort of woodland walk where I can stroll through these gorgeous trees full of blossom in the spring and you know the lovely aroma and the beauty that comes with that and then through the summer the fruit will grow on some of the trees and we'll be able to eat them and the rest of them will be ornamental through the autumn and the winter and obviously food for the wildlife too but along with that I'm going to get some gorgeous autumn colour and I'm really looking forward to that and then I'm also planting trees for winter interest so there's going to be some structure in this part of the garden where we don't have any at the moment and what I'm going to do is show you how we do that I'm going to show you um, how we're planting the trees and how we've positioned them and why I've chosen those spots and then I'm going to tell you about the trees that I've chosen and why I've chosen those trees and what I'm hoping to achieve and I will go into a bit more detail about the exact plants if you're interested in that just skip to the part of the video that I'm putting up on the screen at the moment um, but otherwise I'm going to show you how we plant the trees now this project because we've got quite a few trees to plant I haven't counted but there's probably 15 trees that we're planting at the moment um, because of that it's going to be over a number of weekends so last weekend we positioned everything and we dug the holes although Richard is digging three more holes today so the tree that I'm standing underneath at the moment is the most gorgeous tree it's called a Prunus shirafugan I think that's how you pronounce it um, and we planted this tree about seven years ago and it was a kind of little spindly thing much like the trees that are planting today so in seven years time hopefully I'll have lots of trees that look like this this is an absolutely gorgeous tree let me show you the blossom on this tree it's kind of double soft pink and it's absolutely festooned. This tree is gorgeous and the branches kind of dangle downwards. So when you stand underneath it, it's absolutely spectacular. And with the blue sky in the background, I can't tell you um, just how appealing it is. And what I plan to do in the future when we've kind of cleared the ground underneath this tree a bit more, is I really want to put one of those benches that encircles a tree. And then you can just sit underneath this tree in the sunshine and enjoy the blue skies and the blossom anyway definitely recommend this tree it's absolutely wonderful i love it to pieces i really do so let me show you what we're working with here and i'll try and describe to you the path that i'm trying to create through this little mini orchard at the bottom of the garden so this is the very bottom of our garden and this is the garden wall here at the bottom of the garden and over there is a really old sort of shed lean-to where we used to store all the logs but actually that shed is coming down and we're taking it out and then in that area we're going to have a pond and then all these trees have been placed so that actually what happens is you kind of have to wind your way through um, backwards and forwards from the pond. Now obviously all these areas where the trees are planted they are actually going to be in beds so most of these trees are not going to be on their own they're going to be in actual beds but we haven't dug the ground we um, aren't going to get a digger in we're going to have to do it all by hand so what we've done for tonight is we have marked out um, at least a meter circle um, diameter circle around each of the trees and we've dug kind of a trough out of there we're going to take the whole lot out because it's absolutely covered in weeds particularly ground elder and dandelions and thistles but what we've done for tonight is we've mounded that turf up against the pots so that it doesn't blow over and that's then going to keep the trees in place so that we can then have a look at what everything looks like um, tomorrow morning just make sure everything is exactly how we want it to be okay so we're back this is our second weekend now trying to plant these trees this weekend we've dug all the holes and we're just going to start planting them and i'll show you how we do that so we're going to start by planting this tree here this is a prunus jacqueline and you can see that we've dug a hole at least twice as big in fact it's more than that we've dug um, about a meter circular hole um, but it's at the same depth as the pot so we need to make sure that the root flare at the bottom here isn't below the soil and then we're going to use two stakes one on each side um, in order to stabilize it and prevent it falling over in strong winds 
So we've got some fish blood and bone, which we're going to use as fertilizer. And we've got some mycorrhizal fungi, which we're going to use. And the farm farmyard manure is for um, mulching afterwards to keep the moisture in and to suppress any weeds. As you can see, it's quite weedy around here. We still need to create the bed, but I want to get the trees in so they start growing. So Richard's already dug the hole. And now we're just going to mix in some compost in the yeah. bottom of the hole with this native soil that's around it. And then we're going to position the tree. This is the root flare here. And that needs to be at the surface. So you don't want to bury it. You need to just be able to see a bit of the top, especially if you're going to mulch on top of it. This way, 45 degrees. Okay, I think that's good. I like that. So our wind comes from this direction here. And so we're going to put one stake on this side of the tree and one stake on the other and then strap each stake to the tree and we are going to use a mallet a sledgehammer we're using a sledgehammer apparently not a mallet and you need to get at least a third of each stake into the ground in order to make sure it's completely stable i'm just going to hold the branch out of the way so uh, what we have is a strap and we have a buckle thing which you slide on in order to be able to tighten it. So it just goes on like this. And then these two ends get nailed through one of the holes yeah. to the post. There we have it that is our first tree planted and we've just got a few more to go so we're going to do them all in exactly the same way and the smaller trees we probably aren't going to stake um, we'll just stake the you know tall skinny wobbly ones
actually taken us about three days, not full days, but three days to get all our trees planted. And I think we've planted 16 trees and I've now got this sort of orchardy area at the bottom of the garden that's going to have like a lovely sort of um, a barked walk or chipped barked walk um, that I'm imagining sort of weaving through all of these beautiful trees. So what I'm going to do now is just take you along this sort of woodland walk. Obviously the trees are very small at the moment, but I'm gonna take you along the woodland walk and describe each of the trees to you um, in a little bit more detail and show you some close-ups and I will explain why we chose those particular trees. So it's a little bit difficult to see because um, you know this part of the garden obviously gets full sun and this bit is shaded by the wall especially at this time of year. Um, it's the first of May today um, but I wanted to be able to show you that we've tried to sort of not line everything up so to speak so depending on which angle you look from hopefully you can see that um, even in this bright light, that the trees aren't in a straight line. And so, you know, this is where the arch is um, at the bottom of the garden here. And that was here when we bought the house. We've got this lovely crab apple here called Red Sentinel. In the spring, Red Sentinel has gorgeous pink buds that open out into these really pretty white flowers. And then obviously those turn into crab apples later in the year. And the crab apples are, you know, these huge clusters of bright red fruits. And they're supposedly will stay on your tree all winter as long as the birds don't get them, I'm guessing. Um, red Sentinel is going to grow to about five meters tall and four meters wide in 20 years. That's if you let it, you can obviously prune it. And it's fully hardy here in the UK in my zone, which is 8A in South Buckinghamshire. So in between the two Italian cypresses, but in front of it, we've got a gorgeous weeping cherry tree, which is going to look wonderful in the spring when it blossoms. So what was really important with the cherry is that it was, you know, bang center in the middle of the archway. And so if I turn around, you can see, excuse the sunshine, um, but the weeping cherry is right um, opposite the pointy bit of our archway behind. And so as you come through the archway, you will see this view at the bottom of the garden and obviously everything's going to get much bigger over time. This tree here is the weeping Yoshino cherry tree. Um, its Latin name is Prunus Shidari Yoshino. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's also known as many other things. Um, it's also known as the weeping Tokyo cherry tree. Um, the weeping Japanese flowering cherry tree, but no matter what it's called, it's got these gorgeous dangly branches that in the spring are filled with this lovely white blossom. They've sometimes got a tiny little bit of blush to them. Obviously in the autumn, you're just going to get really attractive fiery colors. This tree likes full sun or dappled shade, and in 20 years, it should grow to about three meters by three meters, which is I think about 10 foot by 10 foot. Um, obviously again, with all all cherry trees you can prune them to suit um, and so if you want to lift it off the ground a bit you can do that as it grows taller. The Italian cypresses behind are quite small at the moment. They can grow to 15 meters but that does depend on the climate um, where you are and also you can trim them if you don't want them to get to 50 meters tall uh, which I don't think we do in our garden but you know we'll play it by ear. It's going to take some time to grow to that height anyway, because I think they're quite slow growing. Now, even though they're Italian cypresses, they can handle up to minus 20 degrees centigrade. So they're fully hardy here in the UK. And it's just going to be this lovely sort of evergreen structure, um, you know, as a view down at the bottom of our garden. And I'm really looking forward to just having something that I've wanted for so long, which is Italian cypresses in my garden. And now I've got some. So this area here, we've got our Cox's orange pippin and the red Falstaff apple. And then this is our Victoria plum tree. So this is kind of like the edible area of our orchard. If I was going to have one tree in my garden, it was absolutely going to be the Cox's orange pippin. It's my absolute favorite apple. I absolutely love it. I'm using absolute quite a lot. <laughs> anyway, this is grown on a MM106 rootstock. Um, which means it's going to get to about three and a half foot tall. It is a mid to late season 
um, ripening variety, but they are best eaten before Christmas, best eaten fresh. Uh, they don't store particularly well. And it's a flowering group three, which is self-fertile. Ours hasn't actually blossomed yet. It's about to bloom in that very fuzzy picture you can see there. <laughs> Anyway, the Cox's Orange Pippin just has this most wonderful taste. As you can see, it dates back um, a very, very long time. They don't do particularly well. Well, they're best grown in a temperate climate, so they don't do particularly well in the States. But there actually is another um, apple that you could use. If you can't grow Cox's, you could try a Rubinet. Um, because apparently that's got a very similar flavour. The other apple tree that I've chosen is the Red Falstaff, and I've chosen this because it's got this really bright ruby red skin, and it's supposedly got a sweet and refreshing flavour, and also it pollinates really well with Cox's Orange Pippin. Now we've chosen a slightly smaller tree. This is grown on an M27 rootstock, so it's only going to grow to about two metres tall, um, and obviously you can prune them to keep them smaller, but this, um, an M27 rootstock would be like ideal for a patio, but I've chosen to put it down here in the orchard, firstly because it needs to be pollinated, and secondly because I wanted slightly differing heights of trees, I didn't want them all to be the same, and I want to be able to see the trees that are behind it and around it, so that's another reason why I've chosen a slightly smaller tree. Apparently it's a really heavy cropper and the apples are going to last well into January, which is really good. Um, also, this one is slightly earlier to set its fruit than the orange pippin um, and you can juice these apples too. So I'm looking forward to being able to take some down to get them juiced locally. Um, that's something that a lot of my friends do and I've never done it. So I'm really excited about being able to do that. I probably won't have enough apples to do that this year, but certainly in the coming years we should do. The next tree is the Victoria Plum. I've chosen this one because I love Victoria Plums. I just love the softer texture to them than the really round plums that I find a bit too firm and they're lovely and sweet. You can use them in jams and puddings and really they don't keep very well so it's best to eat them as soon as they ripen. So I've chosen a smaller tree so that we can eat them all before they go off or at least use them all. If the tree was too big we just wouldn't get through the plums. Um, it's self-fertile, uh, flowering group three and um, this tree has been topped at about six foot, so it's not going to get much taller than about two meters maximum, which is good if you have to net the trees to prevent the wasps eating all your plums. And then right at the front here is the beautiful Circus, which has got this gorgeous variegated leaves and just a really lovely deep splash of pinky purple um, in the spring now. So Circus canadensis, uh, this one's called Carolina Sweetheart, are red buds or Judas trees and they come out in the most amazing vivid pinky purple blossom in the spring. This tree in particular is quite special, the Carolina Sweetheart, because it's got these gorgeous heart-shaped variegated leaves. So they're kind of green in the middle with a, like a whitey pinky margin and they're absolutely beautiful. You can see that it's just about to bloom and the young leaves are sort of this really bright, well, it's in fact it's deep yet bright pinky color, like a really sharp raspberry color. And I am so excited about this tree. It can grow between six and eight meters tall, so it could get quite large, but you can prune these trees. But I have put it right at the forefront so that it's one of the trees that we can see from our kitchen. We can see it really easily from the patio. So not only is this tree gonna look really good in the spring, but it's gonna look fantastic all year long because of this beautiful foliage that it's got, the lovely, gorgeous attractive leaves. The other reason that I've positioned the tree where it is is because um, in the information that I found it does say the best flowering uh, will be had from a sunny position so I've put it in an area where it's going to get full sun all day long. Over here by the wall is a lovely juniper called Blue Arrow. It's also known as the Rocky Mountain Juniper, which is really cool because our whole family loves the Rocky Mountains. Um, this has got like a really sort of upright, pencily thin shape. Um, it's going to grow to between two and two and a half meters tall, but only up to a meter wide at its maximum. And it's going to be quite slow growing, so it won't get there for a while. But it's just got this really lovely, tactile, soft foliage. Um, it's kind of silvery blue in color with the new bits being more sort of limey colored. It likes well-drained soil and it likes full sun to part shade. And it's fully hardy here in the UK. So it's really as suitable for loads of gardens because it's just 
just not going to get too big. Near to the blue arrow, we've planted another malus or crab apple. This one is called Chernoskii. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's also known as the pillar crab apple, and that's because of its very upright sort of flame shaped um, foliage at the top, which um, in the autumn is supposed to be this firecracker of an orange and red colour, sort of looking a bit like a flame. And that's why I chose this particular tree. Um, the actual crab apples themselves are quite small. They're kind of yellowy green with a rosy blush. But in the spring, it's got gorgeous white blossom. And in fact, my tree is still in bloom and it's the beginning of May. So it's one of the later flowering ones, I should think. The other thing is that the foliage in the spring, the young foliage, it is really sort of very pale, um, downy looking leaves. It's going to produce its best autumn colour if it's planted in sun and it likes a moist well-drained soil. It's going to grow to a maximum of five metres by three metres but as with all crab apples you can prune them. And then this tiny little specimen here is the wedding cake tree which is Cornus controversa variegata and it is absolutely tiny at the moment and unfortunately it goes quite slowly but you plant a tree for the next generation so that's what we've done there. In about 20 years this tree should should be about three meters by three meters and it's just going to have the most beautiful variegated foliage with these green centers and deep or quite wide creamy white margins in the spring it's going to have creamy white clusters of flowers and these then form dark berries later on in the year but I'm mainly growing it for this gorgeous tiered shape where the branches sort of make like layers as you'd see in an old fashioned wedding cake. And you know, there are nice spaces between the layers. And then in the autumn, as with all corners, you're going to get some spectacular color. And then next to that, but across the path is this gorgeous tree, which is Picea rydal. This is going to grow to about three meters tall by about one and a half meters wide. It's a lovely conical shape. But the best thing about this tree are these amazing crimson purple shoots that form in spring. They do fade to green, but they start off this incredible color. The saddest thing about that is that uh, Richard's colorblind and he can't see the color. And when I asked him if he liked the shoots, he didn't even realize that they were red. And that's so disappointing, but I can see them and they are spectacular. I absolutely fell in love with this tree. So it's fully hardy and it will take pretty much any soil and likes to be in full sun, but shelter it from winds. So then here next to this tree, we've got the lovely Prunus Jacqueline, which is a lovely ornamental cherry tree. So this cherry will get to about five meters by three meters in 20 years. But the best thing about it is that in the spring, it is smothered in a profusion of these gorgeous single pink flowers. They're slightly carped, but they're absolutely beautiful and just the in most incredible soft pink color. And it's also one of the flowering cherry trees that has the best autumn color. It's fully hardy here in the UK. And if you position it in full sun, you'll get the best autumn color. So kind of in front of the Prunus Jacqueline, we've got a lovely Picea Edith. This is a Colorado spruce. It's quite a large, slow growing conifer with these gorgeous um, blue gray needles on horizontal branches. Um, it does have pine cones in the summer and autumn, but obviously at this height, it's really small at the moment. We don't have any. Um, it's going to grow to about four meters by two and a half meters um, in the right location. So I've allowed it space in case it does get that big, but uh, possibly here in the UK, um, it might not get as big as that. And then over here with the beautiful cherry in the background, that's the Prunus Shirafugan. We've got this gorgeous Pinus Wallichiana. I think that's how you say it. It's a Bhutan pine and it has got the most amazing drooping long thin pines. They kind of drape over the branches like silk tassels and it's so soft and tactile. Ours is looking a little bit yellow. It's been stuck in its pot too long and that's our fault, uh, not the nursery we bought it from, but it's absolutely stunning. This one is going to grow to eight meters by five meters in about 20 years. So it could get really big, but I would not mind that at all. It's so graceful when it blows in the wind. I just absolutely love the movement that's created by these lovely long thin pines. 
and actually this tree would tolerate sandy or you know drought prone soils and things like that so you could plant it in a coastal location but it does need full sun so we've put it here where it's going to get full sun in our garden and I just think it's going to be the most elegant structure you know gracefully moving in the breeze with these lovely long branches with the long thin pine cones I just so excited to have this in my garden and just further down in the middle of what we like to call the new big bed is this gorgeous dwarf Fuji cherry tree it's called Prunus kojanomai and it is only going to grow to about two meters by two meters it's going to take 20 years to get there so it's very slow growing and it can be pruned hard so it's good for a small garden and you could kind of call it a shrub because it's that sort of compact shape and it really is very densely packed with these little leaves um, but in spring in March it's going to burst into life with gorgeous blossom and the blossom is like a really bright white with like little pink centers and there are so many blossoms on this little tree so it just looks like this big white cloud and I really like the tiny little leaves leaves on the plant and how closely packed they are and then obviously in the autumn you're going to get you know really vivid orange colors this is a really easy plant to grow it thrives in both full sun and part shade and as long as the soil is well drained it's just going to be really happy in your garden so I really hope that you've been able to get a fairly good idea of how the sort of woodland orchard area is going to look you need to obviously use a bit of imagination because there are a lot of weeds down there at the moment we haven't you know created the beds yet that are going to be there and we definitely haven't made the path anyway I hope that you've really enjoyed this video if you have then do subscribe to my channel because it really does help me and it'd be wonderful to have you along for future videos and um, if you've enjoyed the video then give it a like because that also really helps me and I would really appreciate it anyway thanks for joining me and I'll see you all next time suspended <laughs> I think we should take that back to the garden centre. That's not good. Really stupid idea. Has that gone through to your leg? <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> I got that on film.